When I am gone, don't you cry for me, don't you pity my sorry soul. What pain there might have been will now be past, and my spirit will Southern Voices of March 2023 20, featured It All Started With An Idea, the story of Dan West and the idea known as Heifer Project. His efforts assisted the survivors of war-torn Europe with livestock to revitalize the agricultural needs of Europe following World War II. Hello, this is Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. Today, we feature the granddaughter of Dan West, Barbara West, who shares another vital service, hospice care, for those who are terminally ill. Barbara, welcome to Brethren Voices. Thank you, Brent. It's great to be here with you today. I'm very excited because I've been wanting to do a program on hospice care for a long time because I think it impacts almost everybody who's alive today at the time when they may not be living much longer. So we need to know about these things. Well, and, and like we say, no one's getting out of here alive, so exactly. end-of-life issues are relevant for all of us at some point. And we seem to often put them aside and put them away and not really talk about it. So today I'm hoping we can talk about it. We will. But first, tell me a little bit about your background, where you grew up, um, where you went to school, how you became interested in hospice. Yeah, so I grew up mostly in Bloomington, Indiana, and Indianapolis, and then I finished high school out in Davis, California, I went to Swarthmore College, and I was very interested in psychology, um, starting off in college, but um, I studied the French feminists who convinced me that the body is essential, that how we exist in the world manifests through our body. So I decided to become an obstetrician. Oh, really? And I went to the Frontier Nursing Service in Kentucky. It was the first place I ever saw babies being born, and I was a courier driving blood samples around on these roads um, that were well paved because of coal money. And um, But still back country. It was back country, but with well paved roads. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, um, and that's where I saw midwives in action, and I saw obstetricians, and I realized I wanted to be present with people not be just the one doing surgery or or managing a team of midwives or working with a team of midwives so um, rather than go to medical school I went to Yale School of Nursing for midwifery training and I only wanted to get my RN uh, license just as a byproduct of becoming a midwife I never wanted to deal with old people or sick people just healthy mothers and babies so it's just kind of ironic that I ended up um, being a hospice nurse for the past 27 years. I think that's very ironic. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry, I don't really know what an obstetrician is. Obstetrician what? is someone who works with pregnant women and helps helps uh, babies come into the world. Okay. 
And I know about midwifery because there's a program on Netflix <laughs> about called a midwife. And That's I've been right. learning a lot about what they do. And, yeah. and they're working with a doctor and, yeah. and they're kind of integral into the whole birth process. But the interesting thing is I was interested in home birth midwifery and hospice is home death. By and large, it's, it's where people live. So if they're living in a facility, by and large, they'll die right where they've been living. Or if they live at home, they'll probably die at home. And so there's a lot of parallels between the home birth that I was interested in and home death, which is what I do work in now. But um, the hospice movement is socially sanctioned in our culture at this time, whereas home birth is still considered pretty radical. And mm -hmm. it, there's been some challenges for midwives who are working that way. Well, hospice wasn't always well accepted, I don't think. That's right. You know, I, I was thinking about this. That I had never really been with a person who died until I was about 50 years old. Mm -hmm. But I had read and had gone to a lecture by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross about death and dying. Mm -hmm. And she had a fascinating perspective that it's okay to talk to people who are dying. And it's important to talk to people who are dying. But I had never done that. And then... Um, Several years later, I had an experience of being with somebody who died. But most of us, it's not part of our experience. Well, that's how it's been for about the past hundred years. Once we invented modern hospitals, both birth and death got displaced there, by and large. And so the modern-day hospice movement in the U.S. has been around since the early 80s. And so little by little, we're developing cultural experience with that. And so now when I'm going to a new hospice patient's home, often the, f the family will have had another family member ha that has been on hospice and they've had some positive experience. So we're starting to build some cultural knowledge mm. again. Okay. Well, that's very good because it makes it a little bit more acceptable and understandable what, what's going to, to happen. So yeah. I'm, I'm hoping we can talk about those things today. Yeah, and there's this, there was a stereotype, and still in some places, that hospice kills people mm -hmm. and it's nice that I'm not confronted with that fear anymore very often anymore oh very good but it, boy if you had to deal with that it's like ay 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 yeah what a beginning to yeah. have to sort out yeah in that realm can you give us an overview of what hospice is and what hospice does sure so the the fundamental thing to know about hospice is that we work as a team so um Anybody who's on hospice has a team of folks that are caring for them, and it's a multidisciplinary team. So not just hospice people, but... Well, within other, hospice. Within, within hospice. hospice. So um, often the, the most visible hospice staff member is a nurse, typically a registered nurse like me. But um, the Medicare hospice benefit requires to have a team of people serving the patient and the family. And so... That team is going to include a nurse, a social worker, and then some kind of counselor or spiritual caregiver, which is uh, typically a chaplain. Mm. But another key uh, member of the team for most patients and families is the hospice aide, um, sometimes referred to as a home health aide, but someone who does personal care and bathing. Then we have nutritionists, we have physical therapists, sometimes speech therapists, and we have a physician who um, is working to help coordinate the team and the physicians will sometimes make home visits as well. So um, hospice care is not done with just one um, isolated caregiver. Well, that's, I, I would never have known that. So, so when you talk about a team, you're talking about a real, a, a real multidiscipline team. Yeah. Um, so how does one qualify for hospice? So um, again, hospice care is, in the United States is generally paid for by Medicare or similar insurance plan. But the Medicare, the way Medicare defines the hospice benefit kind of drives how we set up hospices in the United States. And the criteria is that you have a prognosis, a terminal illness with a prognosis of six months or less. Okay. And then that, that qualifies you to open the door to discuss hospice services. Yeah. But the sad thing about it is due to our culture's fear of death and ongoing denial of death, most people don't get to referred to hospice until they have just a couple days or weeks mm. to live. And as a hospice intake nurse, 
sometimes I'm going out to see somebody and they've already died the morning before I get there. Wow. So our ability to grasp when someone has six months or less is still pretty limited within our culture and among physicians and, and um, other healthcare practitioners. Well, that, that, that's a pretty difficult diagnosis to, to really to predict it in some cases. I'll, so although I know yeah. some people get a, a, a diagnosis or a, a range to say, well, you mm -hmm. can, you're going to live six to nine months. And the, the nice thing is, as the Medicare hospice benefit evolved in the 80s, they realized you know, it's not possible to predict that with accuracy. And so we have some um, flexibility. Mm -hmm. So at any given moment, a hospice patient has to appear to have six months or less. But sometimes folks improve quite a bit with hospice care. So we may have someone on our service for six months and they're still with us and we reevaluate at that time. And if at that point they still have a prognosis of six months or less, they can stay on hospice longer. So I have had patients for a couple years. Oh. And sometimes folks get so much better that they graduate off of hospice, but then they could come back on again at a future time. Because it's Medicare related, is it pretty similar in all the states? I think so. I mean, the, the Medicare benefit is a federal benefit. Um, and the guidelines are, are federal guidelines? Yeah, and then you will have Medicaid um, for folks that aren't covered with Medicare by Medicare, Medicaid may chip in for folks with lower incomes, and that can vary state to state. Um, one of the things that varies a lot, though, is what the daily rate that the hospice is going to be paid. Mm -hmm. And that's a very controversial topic, and, and the way that rate is set is kind of, um, it may be county by county, but the dollar amount that the hospice is going to get for every day they have a patient on surface varies dramatically from one place to another. And what I forgot to mention also is a bereavement team is an integral, integral part of hospice care. And so if a patient does die on hospice, then the family, the survivors are going to be um, receiving care for the following year. And there's all kinds of um, bereavement support for the community that hospices provide. But a lot of that care is funded through their own fundraising because the Medicare benefit doesn't provide a lot of extra money for that. But what the Medicare benefit does uh, mandate that we provide is any medications related to comfort or the terminal illness, any equipment and supplies also. And so that's a, there's a lot of things that are covered within that. And that's, again, where the success of hospices can vary based on their reimbursement and local costs. Okay. What would you say is the goal of hospice in, in general? <sighs> or is that a fair question? Well, um, you know, when I was a young hospice nurse 27 years ago, I thought the goal of hospice was for people to have a comfortable death at home, you know, surrounded by their loved ones. But I've learned the hard way that the goal of hospice is to get to know that person and their family and to determine their goals. And then mm -hmm. our goal is to try to help them realize their goals as much as we can. Okay. And so in some cases, uh, maybe you're, I'm uh, visiting a family from a medically underserved population, and that 911 call, an ambulance ride to the hospital, is kind of a ceremonial rite of passage for them. And I used to think that was a failure when that would happen on hospice care, but now I've had to broaden my cultural um, perspective and see that that, that may be perfectly what that person wanted or needed. So in some ways, from that perspective, that's their formal way of saying goodbye because they're being handed over to another level of care. It's and technically, the way the hospice benefit is designed, we're trying to keep people at home mm -hmm. and, and minimize that kind of medical involvement, but that may not be a cultural fit. Another example of this is uh, working in West Sacramento with uh, conservative Christian Ukrainian families, uh, the fact that we were even saying, talking about a prognosis of six months or less was considered blasphemous because only God can know how long someone will live and the family was actively praying for the recovery of someone who appeared to us close to death and so those conversations can get uh, pretty complicated and that's why we need to train ourselves culturally and it's important that hospices have um, good representation from within the community for their staff and volunteers. Oh, and volunteers. I didn't mention about volunteers. 
Um, every hospice is required by Medicare to have volunteers, and volunteers are such an important part of what every hospice does. A lot of volunteers are providing uh, patient care right at the bedside or chair side or car or wherever people are but they're also helping us in the office, they're helping with the bereavement program, they're helping with um, community events, so uh, volunteers are another really important part of the team. What does hospice do? I mean, what, it, <laughs> what do you actually do? <laughs> but I, and yeah. I understand that's a, that's a really broad question, yeah. but in general, if you can talk about it, what yeah. <laughs> hospice does. Well, the first thing we do is we look closely at a person's medical psychological and resource condition and just see, do are they terminally ill? Do they have a prognosis of six months or less? And are they in a situation where we're able to provide care for them? And that can take a lot of figuring out sometimes. Um, the first few days or weeks that someone's on hospice tends to be pretty medically dominated. Often people come to us in a lot of pain. Maybe they haven't been sleeping. Maybe they're short of breath. Maybe they've had a neurological deterioration and their family is struggling with how to care for them and keep them safe. So um, there's often, in those first few days of hospice, we're often kind of putting out fires. We're um, getting comfort meds delivered within a few hours. We're um, giving the families a folder of information about how to position uh, someone in bed. We're ordering a hospital bed, we're ordering oxygen if someone's having trouble breathing. So when people initially get on hospice care, it often seems like we're medically managing a situation. We're coordinating with their primary care doctor. For instance, yeah. when you're talking about meds, does the yeah. doctor have to order the meds? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. You, so you're suggesting to the doctor or recommending what kinds of things? We're suggesting to their primary care doctor, but a lot of times primary care doctors don't have the knowledge or the availability to do that hour by hour um, kind of urgent dosing of medication, so often our medical directors are stepping in to um, and their provide doctors that expertise. Also. Yeah, our medical directors are our physicians. Okay. So, so it's very medically driven often at first, um, but once we are able to get a situation stabilized, hopefully they've been referred early enough that they're not dying in the first 24 hours of hospice care, which happens an awful lot. Um, but then once things are stable, that's where these issues of grief and loss, maybe denial on the part of the person who's dying or maybe some faraway family member, we start, the chaplain's able to visit and the social worker, the volunteer, and we're starting to get to issues of, are, is there unfinished business? Um, sometimes people are struggling to get their finances in order or make funeral, or funeral arrangements. But often, um, maybe there is an estranged family member or um, a secret that they want to unburden themselves of. And that's, that's the deeper level of hospice care. That's, um, it's those kinds of things and those stories that really inspire us to keep uh, working in this field. In listening to what you just said, I've had two aunts who died who totally different experiences. One was in hospice and got well, as you were saying, and was taken off of hospice. And when she was in a nursing home and that she went back to her adult community for a brief time. Yeah. And I think the hospice care was really good. I actually was there and they were, they were there 24 hours a day, mm. which I wanted to ask you about. I think that, is that usual? Well, I, and I'm not sure how that worked. Yeah, I, my guess would be in your aunt's case that she or her family members hired private caregivers around the clock. And um, hospice care in general in the U.S. is routine home care. And so the hospice workers are only visiting intermittently um, for an hour or so at a time. But we're there to make sure there is a 24-hour caregiving in place. So we may be training the family mm -hmm. or helping them to privately hire people. There are some rare instances um, called continuous care where there's a crisis of symptoms and hospice um, staff will provide care most of the time around the clock, but that's extremely rare and only for a very limited time. Yeah. Are there levels of hospice? That's right. So the Medicare hospice uh, benefit provides routine, routine home care, which is 99% of what hospice care is. 
there's the continuous care benefit um, to provide um, resolution of a symptom crisis in the home. And for extreme cases, we have what's called the general inpatient benefit. And that's where we're not able to get somebody comfortable at home and we actually admit them to the hospital for you know, a certain period of time. It's evaluated every 24 hours to try to use the tools available in the hospital to get them comfortable and hopefully bring them back home. And then the other um, benefit is called respite care. And um, that's where a caregiver is maybe um, has a medical procedure themselves or they need a break or they need to go on vacation or attend a funeral perhaps. And so hospice will pay for placement in a nursing home for about a five to seven day period mm -hmm. if it's available. It's, it's very hard to arrange in this day and age with short staffing at most nursing homes, but that is technically part of the hospice Medicare benefit. If you have someone in your family who looks like or sounds like or may be appropriate for hospice, what do you do? What's the referral <laughs> process? Because I have yeah. a... I think my another aunt was eligible, but we didn't know anything about it. Yeah. Didn't call anybody. Yeah. She died in the hospital, and she could have probably died at home if we had known what you're telling it me now. It still happens all the time, and and you would ideally a patient's physician recognizes that they're within six months uh, to the end of their life and refers to hospice, but it doesn't happen a lot of the time still. And so it's important to know that anyone can call hospice. You can just call your local hospice and say, I think I'm eligible for hospice, or I think my loved one is eligible. And that hospice can talk to you over the phone, and they can even send someone to your home to assess that. Ultimately, a physician is gonna to have to certify, technically two physicians. It's typically the primary care doctor and the hospice a medical director. But um, we've seen cases where the primary care doctor insists that the person is not eligible, but in fact they are. And so it's always fine to just call hospice yourself. No, when we call hospice, because is there one per county or per city or so, is there one hospice or are there multiple providers of well, hospice? Brent, I hate to break it to you, but we are living in a, with a capitalist healthcare system. And so uh, we have many hospice providers. I mean, in the 80s, it started as all volunteer organizations. And then once the Medicare benefit came through, they were by and large nonprofits. But now um, for-profit hospices dominate the industry. And the, um, the, the formerly volunteer and nonprofit ones are, um, not many of them survive anymore, at least mm -hmm. in California and Oregon. And so... Um, so when you look up hospice, you're going to have a lot of... <laughs> I would People advocate that you try to find a nonprofit hospice. Um, I've worked in in hospices that were affiliated with large healthcare organizations, and I've certainly seen some excellent care there. But I've tended to find better, more hospicey kind of holistic care in the organizations that are the freestanding nonprofit hospices. But um, you can see great hospice care in provided by all the different kinds of companies. And you can see not so great hospice care provided by everybody as well. So it varies a lot. People often go with word of mouth. Um, and if you know someone who's had a good hospice experience, then that I would look up that hospice. Is there a rating system like Yelp has or Google has? To I, I think there are. And there's, um, and I, I wouldn't necessarily trust that. I would, I would look for a hospice that has a strong volunteer program and a strong bereavement program. And I would look for a hospice that's providing bereavement services to the community. Um, the hospice I work for provides caregiving resources. They provide a class for caregivers to prevent caregiver burnout. And that's offered to anybody in the community who's caring for a loved one. So those are, to me, telltale signs that this is a hospice that really has the big picture in mind. Wow, you, you're really teaching us a lot. <laughs> At one point, I actually had visited two different hospice homes in Portland. One was primarily dealing with AIDS patients, mm -hmm. but another one uh, was actually called Hospice House. Mm -hmm. And they had, it was a residential program mm -hmm. where everybody who was there, the residents were all in hospice, mm -hmm. and they had a full-time caregiving mm -hmm. uh, staff. Yeah. So you mentioned something like that, but uh, are those relatively available in other places? Or? Um. The general hospice houses, like you describe, are pretty few and far between. And 
I wish it was more available because as I was saying, it's very difficult sometimes to arrange 24 hour caregiving. And um, I'm not sure exactly how the reimbursement works for those hospice houses, but um, I'm so glad that they exist and I wish there were more of them. And the, the root word for hospice comes from, you know, hostile. And so we think of hospice as a place and that's, that's I think where the word came from, but that's not how it's been in the United States. It, it is more that way in other countries. On the other side of it, um, a large number of hospice patients that I've served have neurological conditions like Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's. And so I've worked, I've done hospice visits in quite a few memory care units that have a lot of hospice experience mm -hmm. or some assisted living homes. And so what I've seen is that there are a lot of folks out there who have a lot of experience with hospice care and are providing expert end of life care but you just can't tell from the way their their business is set up that they are expert hospice care providers because it's just part of what they do. The one thing that's tricky is if you're in a Medicare skilled bed in a nursing home, as often happens when someone comes out of the hospital, so you're re receiving active physical therapy or rehab care, you can't receive active skilled nursing care, rehabilitation care and hospice at the same time. It's one or the other. If, if, if it's an end-of-life situation, typically those services wouldn't be as beneficial, but it also has to do with being paid out of the same pot. And so there can be some awkward moments where if someone's in uh, a nursing home bed being paid for by Medicare, and then maybe they want hospice care, but at that point they'll have to start paying cash, paying their own money for the nursing home care, and that can be um, extremely uh, unavailable for a lot of people. Yeah. I want to mention that Brethren Voices featured a program on hospice in June of 2021, titled The Introduction of Hospice in China, with an interview of co-executive directors of Global Missions for the Church of the Brethren, Eric Miller and Rosha Lee. Hospice was actually introduced in China by Rosha Lee, who studied hospice and had experienced hospice services in the United States. She took her education home to her hometown and introduced it in a hospital that was founded by Church of the Brethren in 1911. It was a truly amazing interview that we did via Zoom in China. You can view the program on YouTube. Barbara, it's been wonderful having you on Brethren Voices. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you for having me, Brent. It's just been great to talk to you. It's been delightful and it's such an education. For Brethren Voices, this is Brent Carlson. And Barbara West. Wishing, Wishing you, you peace. peace.